Tuesday. We're in the middle of July, and we're also in the middle of Operation Safe Driver Week. So why am I mentioning that? Because we're going to be talking about safety today. But instead of focusing on commercial vehicles, we'll be talking about safe homes. If it's not wildfires and the smoke associated with those, it's hurricanes or extreme heat or flooding. At times, it might feel like we're living on some type of alien planet. So what can we do from a building science perspective to protect ourselves or at least adapt to it? Well, we're gonna talk about the various technologies that can help us meet those challenges. Here to help us sort through all this is Matt Power, editor in chief of Green Builder Media. It's largely because of Matt that Green Builder Magazine has been named best residential trade magazine for eight consecutive years from the National Association of Real Estate Editors. Matt has an award-winning nearly three-decade career reporting on innovation and sustainability in housing. He has a long history of asking hard questions and adding depth and context as he unfolds complex issues. Now, before we get going, I wanted to let you know today's webinar sponsors are Panasonic Solar. With Panasonic solar panels and battery storage, you can generate and store clean power for years to come. We'll help you get started and give you all the information up front before you commit to your investment. Once you know the details, you'll see how solar makes sense for you. Next is the Metal Roofing Alliance. The Metal Roofing Alliance helps guide homeowners in their search for a new roof by providing accurate information, comprehensive research, and examples of quality metal roofing in action. And finally, our friends over at PowerShift by NV Energy. PowerShift by NV Energy is a program that helps residential and business customers conserve energy and save money on their power bills. PowerShift is a one-stop resource to find energy-efficient products and services. For more information, please visit nvenergy.com slash PowerShift. Now, if you've attended our webinars before, you know you are welcome to submit questions for our guest. Simply use the questions box on the right side of your screen. I'll review those questions and pose them to Matt during the Q&A time set aside after his presentation. Matt, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking some time out of your afternoon or morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, today, I want to talk about some stuff that I think will have a, a deeper meaning for all of us, which is some of the existential threats that I think we're feeling after a, a rough year with the pandemic. Uh, now we've got all this crazy stuff happening in terms of weather. We've got these giant heat domes forming uh, around different parts of the planet. We've got monster storms. We're expecting a big hurricane season. Uh, we've got a massive drought out west. Uh, I think we're all feeling a little bit besieged. And now this webinar, when I do these webinars, normally I speak to sort of a general audience. So I'm going to try to find something for everybody as I was putting it together. So I was thinking of builders, architects, but also homeowners, uh, even renters, people Everybody has an interest in this topic, which is how to be more resilient, how to live with a feeling of safety as opposed to a feeling of fear. And, you know, building science can only do so much. But I, but I think I've got some ideas that maybe you haven't heard before or maybe um, you've heard a little bit about and maybe I can fill in a little bit of the blanks on it. Uh, that might make you feel a little better and maybe make you feel like you've got some defenses against uh, the ravages of nature that, that seem to be happening around us. So I'm going to move on to the slideshow now. I'm going to shut off my video and walk you through this. Okay, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the problems. I think I'll, we're aware, right? We're aware that CO2 levels are going up, right? If you're on this call, then you're, you're probably somewhat in touch. We tend to reach a, a fairly progressive uh, group of people who, who do care about the future and maybe have sort of done their own research and internalized some of this. So just a couple of statistics that, that we are at a point that Basically, humankind has never been at before with CO2 levels. We're seeing these heat waves. I think uh, Death Valley either hit 130 or is about to hit 130, which I believe is a record for the planet the other day. So 
uh, when you start talking about that, and, and I think even places where we thought it was safe, like the Northwest, I heard that uh, in British Columbia, temperatures hit 115, 120 degrees. They don't have air conditioning up there. They are not prepared for that kind of extreme heat. So there are some people, I think, who are sort of reeling in shock from some of this weather behavior and feeling a little uneasy about where things are going. This story came out today. Amazon rainforest now emitting more CO2 than it absorbs. Okay, so think about that for a second. We've all, all of us who grew up, you know, listening to, you know, Al Gore and paying attention to, uh, you know, CO2. We always were sort of told that that the, the rainforest was going to save us and that we should save the rainforest. Well, this story was in The Guardian and, and several other um, news outlets today that the rainforest is not going to save us. In fact, the they're burning so much of the rainforest, they're producing more CO2 just in the rainforest than it can absorb. Now, I just think that's an existential fact worth thinking about because what that means to me is no one's going to save us except us from the runaway tipping point effects of climate change. Now, you may recognize this picture. Uh, this was taken in Texas this winter, okay? So Texas, where you know some of our coworkers work in Austin, it doesn't freeze in Texas. It certainly doesn't hard freeze. They had a hard freeze that basically shut down the grid, right? So when they had this hard freeze, no one was prepared. Pipes in houses froze. They didn't have shutoff systems built into these houses. Um, you know, real estate all over Texas was destroyed. So this was another shocking weather event that no one saw coming. So just because we talk about global warming, global warming doesn't mean every place is going to get warmer. What it means is every place is going to get more unpredictable. I, I, I always love this old movie with Charlton Heston, The Omega Man, because, you know, one of the things that we're up against right now is, is also our mindset. And there's a friend of mine describes it this way is sort of half the population has a mindset of scarcity and half the population has a mindset of uh, sort of abundance. And some we have to meet somewhere in between. I say this movie was about you know a, a guy who had a scarcity mindset, which is basically not much you could do. Everything was going to go to hell. And you'd sit in your penthouse apartment with your rifle and try to fend off the mutants. Now, I don't think we have to go there. And I, I, I hope that that reality never becomes the reality that, that we really embrace in the country. And then, you know, this is sort of a, another vision of where things are going is that we're all going to live in tiny houses. You know, I've written a lot about tiny houses. The reality is most of us don't want to live in tiny houses. We don't want to throw away our lifestyle. We don't want to scale down. I mean, this might be a temporary transitional housing. And, and I, I have a niece who's building a tiny house and I, I applaud her. Uh, I won't get in too far into the weeds on that, but one of my problems with tiny houses is the way people use them. They build a tiny house and then they use it as a travel base and they fly all over the world and burn more CO2 than they ever would have in a full-size house. So there's some catches to the tiny house thing, but is that our is that our future? I don't know, maybe not. Here's another version of the future. This is sort of the net zero house, right? Which we love net zero houses. Of course, not everyone can afford to build a net zero houses. Land prices are extremely high. But in my view, anyone who can afford to build a new house today should be building net zero. And by net zero, meaning you're producing enough energy on site that you don't need to pull from the grid as well. That way, especially if you're building a little larger house, the main impact from your house is the embodied energy of constructing it, which is still significant. Um, but at, at the very least, you're not using energy for the next 250 years while that house is occupied. So that's sort of the that, that's sort of the holy grail. The dream would be if everybody could, you know, build a net zero house. Obviously, that's not achievable by much of the population. But when you do, when you are in that small niche that can afford to build new, net zero is the way to go. And building codes are moving there anyway. Ultimately, I think you're going to see that uh, it's mandated. This is another problem that we're up against. Um, there's very little understanding of why these things are happening or what's happening 
or how to respond to it. I, I love this cartoon because I remember people, you know, pulling all the thousands of rolls of toilet paper off the shelves in the during the pandemic. Uh, you know, and I wrote about this. A much easier solution would be to put a bidet in your house, which uses a minimal amount of water, doesn't require any toilet paper. Problem solved. Uh, you know, uh, to every sheet of toilet paper requires two gallons of water to produce, right? So these items that I've listed down the side, you know, I've mentioned some of these. The last one is hubris. And also thinking that we can uh, simply wait out the storm or, or technology out the storm is not going to be good enough. I mean, some of the ideas I'm going to give you today are building science technology. It will protect you in the short term, but we do need a major behavior shift, and not just individually, but on the sort of industrial and corporate level, if we're actually going to try to reverse some of these runaway climate change issues, if it's not too late. And back to my theme, living on an alien planet. We're not living, uh, you know, as if we would on, on Mars or Venus yet, where, you know, temperatures are like, you know, hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit or hundreds of degrees below zero. Um, thank goodness, right? So when I say life support systems, let's look closer at them, some things we can do uh, at the local level with our housing and whether we're building, remodeling, uh, or just rethinking our housing to make it more resistant, safer, maybe ease that feeling of anxiety that we have inside about, about the future. Heat. Okay, so heat, I think right now, you know, we, we do a lot of research on the web to see who's reading what on our website, and we scan for words. And in the past uh, month or so, the the topic of heat and cooling has blown everything else out of the water. Nobody, it, there's no other topic that's being talked about more than how to deal with this sudden heat. And I live in Maine, and even here, uh, you know, I have heat pumps on my on my building. I three years ago, I never ran them for an entire summer. Now I have run them the entire summer, and it's each year has gone up more. And I think this is the common around the country. So let's, this, this is a, just a quick list of some of the stuff I'm going to touch on. Let's start with the easy stuff, the, the tree cover. Um, tree, you know, low, literally low hanging fruit, right? One of the things that's interesting is that, you know, trees have other effects other than just creating shade, right? They're, you know, keeping soils cool. They're keeping organisms and photosynthesis going that uh, is helping to sort of digest or internalize some of that CO2. So, you know, not everybody has the option of trees, but when you do and you can build in a spot that's decided to use tree cover, that's a natural way to knock down some of that sun energy. But and this is sort of the caveat to this, um, this was a University of Utah study that even where there were trees and grass, you're only really knocking the heat down by two degrees, right? Now, when you're up in the 115 degree range, two degrees is, hey, it's better than nothing, but is, is it a significant dent in what we need to accomplish? No. Is, is it going to save someone's life? Eh, that's debatable. Uh, one of the things which actually I found a little bit disappointing is grass actually works better than trees at dissipating heat because I've always been, um, you know, sort of arguing that we need to have fewer lawns because, you know, for various reasons because they're water intensive, but grass because of its uh, sort of the way that it uses water and, and, and keeps soil at the ground level cool is actually quite good at keeping areas like around your house cool. Um, this is just a quick look at how much tree cover is there and grass cover, for example, in various US cities, right? So if you can, if you, I don't know if you can read that, but the blue is grass. So, you know, different cities have, and it makes sense, um, you know, there's there's a lot more grass in uh, Houston than in Sacramento. Um, it, it just follows the climate. So tree canopy, if you see in the red, 
uh, Chicago has a fairly small tree canopy. So I, it, this might suggest that Chicago might be at a higher risk for the urban heat island effect, right? It's, it's something to think about. My city of, in Maine, in Portland, is, uh, is a tree. I uh, can't remember the, the award they give it because there's a lot of trees. And, and they do keep the streets and the buildings cooler. But when it's 95 degrees out, not significantly cool. Here's the other catch any vegetation needs water, right? So especially with grass, um, you need a significant amount of water. And what's happening, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, we're having droughts. Uh, so again, trees may not be the solution that we all hoped. They're a small step, but we are limited, especially with these water issues that we're having. They're not going to save us alone. Um, other research, um, I think this from U University of California, uh, is that if you the best situation is where you do a mix of perennial plants. Um, you create a canopy with trees. Uh, if you see in the bold there, 50% less water demand than a cool season lawn, 30% than a warm season lawn. So I guess this is on the on the flip side of that. If you do mix it up with greenery around your house or your development or your subdivision, um, a, the combination of different types of plants is going to serve you better than just you know putting down a, a lawn and and chopping it down to a, an, an eighth of an inch every two weeks. So uh, some good news there. Now, here's another thing, um, a trend in the building industry, and we've encountered this, you know, when I go to the building shows and I talk to the window makers, I say, what do people want? Well, what they want is gigantic glass window walls. So you can see where this might be a problem in a world where, you know, sun and heat are getting worse every year. This particular story is in the Wall Street Journal, and this couple put this, uh, they had 2,700 square feet of Marvin windows, spent $300,000 on them, but there was a catch, which was then they realized that they were under glass, right? And everyone could see into their building. I, I believe they ended up selling it. I'm not, I'm, I didn't read the whole article, but uh, they put up a bunch of security cameras. So it turned into um, be careful what you wish for situation. So maybe that's, you know, a message that can get out is I, I know everybody wants views, right? When people spend big money on places, they want views. But this house also was built in the Northwest, right? So you would assume, oh, we're in the Northwest. We're never going to have a 115 degree day up here. Well, I wonder how many of those people are rethinking their choices to go with these giant window walls. Now, there is a way to make these window walls, you know, more efficient and less sort of, I guess, dangerous, if you want to put it that way. If you put a like a patio with a, uh, you know, a roof over it, out a, an extended patio or an extended eave, you could certainly block most of the direct sun coming. And also, there are high quality glazings, like triple glazings and tr and combined with low E and argon gas and that sort of thing, where you can make the windows much more efficient. So I guess my sort of final word on it would be if you if you really want those window glass systems, you really need to up the ante and go for the absolute premium products um, and really think through solar gain on these to reduce heat. Now, if you were actually going to build a house and you wanted it to be resilient, and use windows in a way that would reduce the amount of solar gain, you'd, you'd optimize it, you'd aim the house right in the right way, right? Um, and you would put overhangs that would block, especially in the summer, that would keep the sun from beating in those windows. Now, um, I'll borrow from Building Green, they did some research on this, and they said for a passive solar, to minimize passive solar, they said you should put no more than about 8% of your floor space in windows on the south face of your home. They suggested using low E2 glass uh, glazings. And they said those have less th those have less than 50% of the heat gain compared with conventional insulated. So if you know what don't know what insulated glass is, that's the you know the basic uh, double pane glass that uh, you know you you pick up at, at Lowe's or Home Depot if you're just buying you know off the shelf insulated glass windows. Um, so let's move on to other, you know, the other places of the house where you're gaining a lot of heat, of course, the roof. <clears throat> and um, if you've ever lived in the south, 
right? Like usually by about midday, if you don't have a well-insulated attic, uh, that attic starts to really heat up. Uh, now there's different ways that roofs get rid of heat or give it back, shall we say, and I'm not gonna read everything on this chart, but you can look at this and, and this is a bigger chunk of a way to keep things cool, right? Seven to 15% energy savings on household cooling, according to Green Building Alliance, if you use what's called a cool roof, which is a roof that's really designed to get rid of some of this heat. Now, and these things, you know, these aren't just uh, sort of recommendations. I mean, I think these are, again, are becoming existential decisions. Uh, you know, if you live in a place where if temperatures continue to rise, which is no sign that they will not, um, we don't know yet what the top is, then don't you want to be on the, uh, I guess, on the winning side of that equation, which is with a roof that can deflect and re-emit as much of that heat as possible? Um, this is a chart from some research. <clears throat> um, note on the left, okay, so that they said a black roof. So I believe what that roof is, is some kind of uh, like an asphalt or modified asphalt or what they call an EPDM, which is like a rubberized black roof. These are sort of the ones that absorb the most heat. Uh, they, it says this one could heat up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine a poorly insulated attic with that kind of heat on the roof. And also when you heat things up, almost anything, perhaps with the exception of metal, you reduce its lifespan, right? So when things are overheated, they're just going to last longer. Now in the middle is an example of a metal roof. Now this is just a metal roof with no special uh, features, right? So metal just in general does better than uh, like an asphalt roof because metal itself has a high emittance, right? The heat radiates off of it. Now, if you paint a roof white and you look over on the right, and this applies especially to metal roofs, you've got very high reflectance and high emittance. So you can really shed a huge amount of that heat from the sun. Um, our friends over at the Metal Roofing Alliance uh, gave us some of these stats, but so a, a basic metal roof can emit as much as 85%. They said even dark colors do this. Um, Energy Star, which are the ones that are, you know, specially designed with lighter colors and that sort of thing, uh, can reduce heat temperatures by 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's heat that your cooling system in your house doesn't have to deal with. Uh, this, there were some interesting ideas put out by um, <clears throat> Matt Reisinger, which I'm going to borrow here. One of the ways that you could make a metal roof, he suggests, shed even more heat is to angle the purlin. So you see those pieces of wood, those are called purlins, and the metal lays on top of those. So normally they're horizontal, they're at a 90 degree angle to the standing seam panel. So it's sort of hard for the heat, any heat that's trapped to get out. Now with these angled purlins and they're staggered at the top, the heat can enter at the bottom and eject out through like a, uh, a ridge vent on the top of the roof. So I thought this was a cool idea and, and one I haven't really seen honestly in action yet, but the thing I, I will put a caveat, which is check your standing seam insulation specs. They may have a certain required mailing pattern. I don't wanna cause you to uh, lose your warranty because you didn't follow their nailing schedule. So um, now, uh, Joe Stebrex, uh, a friend and you know, Reese, and frequent um, contributor in words to, to our magazine, and Joe and I have had many conversations about unvented attics. He's a big believer in unvented attics. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, I'm sure you've at least heard the term. What normal attics, meaning the ones that are typically you know required in your area by code, are these. Um, like this little inset that says not this. So the air comes up through a soffit vent, it goes up into your attic, and then it, it goes out through the top of your roof peak or through a powered fan, or you see the, the vented area, that might be a powered vent or just a passive gable vent. The problem is all that air is actually going into your house, right? So you're then reliant on having a high level of insulation above your ceilings on your on your second floor, right? To, to keep that heat 
trapped in that attic uh, rather than into your house. Now, this, as you can imagine, can create all kinds of problems. First of all, if it's in a hot climate, you've got to run a power vent all the time because it could get dangerous hot up there. Um, also, if you don't have the right insulation, that heat's going to be going to pull down all night long. You're going to be getting that heat coming down into the building uh, through your ceiling area. Uh, on the left, you see an example. Now, there's many different ways to do an unvented attic, right? Which means you're going to put a impermeable layer on that's the root that yellow area is the impermeable stuff like a closed cell uh, spray foam and then you insulate further underneath it and the attic essentially becomes part of your conditioned space so it's no longer you know raging hot during the day and this also allows you to run air conditioning pipe ducts and that sort of thing through there without them getting warmed up incidentally as they pass through there there's also a perk, for example, if you use um, if you use a spray foam product on a roof, like say you convert, say you had an attic and it's got uh, blown in insulation and you decide to convert it to a uh, unvented attic, one perk you get is the University of Gainesville did a study that shows when you put in certain amounts of spray foam into against a roof deck like this, it increases the hurricane like wind lift resistance by 250%. So make your house, especially if you have an older house and you want to A, make it more efficient and B, make it more hurricane proof. This is a, a relatively uh, affordable way to do it. I think I've seen, you know, estimates for a small house around maybe 2,600 bucks. Don't quote me on that, but that's, I have seen some estimates in that range. So you, if you did the math on that, I think you'd get a fairly uh, reasonable payback on your investment. Now there is the caveat with that is your roof cannot have leaks in it when you put this spray foam in because water that's coming through would be trapped between the spray foam and the roof deck and that could cause you big troubles down the road. This is another uh, cool idea. I thought I'm part of this Matt Reisinger thing that I'm, I'm borrowing and it was Steve Easley who I, I work with almost on a daily basis who's doing a project with us right now confirmed that this idea of putting one inch of rigid foam on top of your roof instead of under it. Um, they, there was some research that showed that this could drop the temperature inside the attic to the ambient temperature outside, if that makes sense. So simply by adding one inch of foam. Now, I think we need more research on this, but you can imagine uh, if you did this and then did some of that unvented attic uh, insulation, the sandwich in there, you could get an incredibly tight roof shell where essentially you could keep, I'd say most, if not all of the heat outdoors, which would be the ideal scenario. You put a metal roof on it, um, it's a forever roof, and you're basically, you've removed the roof from the, as part of the problem, right? One thing I just did want to mention, uh, certain kinds of foam melt at a fairly low temperature. EPS foam melts at 212 degrees. So, you know, this this chart um, was is a couple of years old, I think. But, you know, temperatures, we've seen temperatures we like we've never seen before. So my guess is that some roofs in these new super high temperatures are actually closing in on the point at which foam melts. So that's something to think about, uh, especially if you've got a black roof, right, which you're trying to put this foam underneath. Uh, I would not advise, for example, putting it in direct contact with some kind of like asphalt shingles, that sort of thing. You could at least use, they do make asphalt shingles that have a reflective, you know, cool roof coating. But again, my recommendation would be to just, just do it once and do it with metal and, uh, or, or, you know, something that, that you don't have to mess with later. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention as a way to keep roofs cool, um, this is some fairly new research. Uh, solar panels on your roof actually help with cooling the roof. So they, they shade it, which is natural, right? There's usually a gap between the roof and the panels. Um, and it, according to this study, uh, they also help a little bit in the winter by holding heat in. Now, what I don't know is how that would compare, for example, um, you know, it, it, you, you really have to have an engineer look at, you know, what percentage of your roof is covered with solar, what percentage of it do you want to have as, you know, painted white or a cool roof system. So there's more research to be done on this, but I do think it's an, it's interesting food for thought that solar panels actually can, can be a perk to helping keep buildings cool. 
Okay, so let's just shift a little bit into energy and what you can do. You know, one of the things we're seeing and, and one of the panic items that's happening is grid outages, right? Um, this again, there's the Texas one. Uh, grid operators, so the grid operators are not really making us feel better, right? They're all warning us. It's sort of like I, I got a recently got a warning from my gas company that had like, you know, 10 things on it that I need to be worried about. Um, the grid operators are basically trying to figure out how to prevent catastrophic failures um, and they're asking their customers to help. So that's sort of, that's a red flag to me and that's a good reason to get solar. And it's to start thinking about residential solar, not just because uh, grid-based solar, I, I love that too. But again, that's, that's dependent upon the grid. So the grid has to stay up. This also came, it was a couple of days ago, uh, Governor Newsom, California, ordered the, to allow the emergency use of ship engines to boost power. That, if that doesn't scare you, um, then maybe you're just immune to this stuff. But that to me is a sort of a, a little bit of an act of disparate. We're relying on ships offshore now to, to produce electricity, to keep people cool so they can live. That, that sounds like a, another good reason to uh, take action on your own. This is um, a, a transformer, an electrical transformer, and just a quick story. So Steve Easley I was talking to yesterday, he said one of the things he ran into is he try he's trying to switch his house to all electric with a big solar array on it that's grid tied. So he had to put in a new panel in his house, but it's a, a 400 amp panel. So the utility, the local utility said, well, okay, then you have to pay for a new transformer because the transformer can't handle that. So here's the kind of stuff that's coming up now with um with electricity, this is a new frontier. I don't know whether he'll actually end up having to pay for it, but it's food for thought that there are um, sort of unknowns out there as we move toward a more renewable way of living. And you know what it may mean is that Steve ultimately says, forget it, I'd rather put the X number of thousands of dollars into a battery storage system than have to deal with potentially rebuilding transmission lines and transformers for the utility. So I don't know where that'll go, but but stay tuned, we'll probably write about it. Um, NV Energy, uh, who's also just is one of the sponsors for this, uh, this webinar, uh, great company, great utility company that we like because we, we try to partner with progressive uh, companies that are doing something about the problem. NV Energy, um, over the last few years has gone honestly more and more in a sustainable direction. You can see they are shifting out of coal generated power into renewables. But the other thing they've done, which is really um, unusual, is they've also gotten into storage. So they're figuring out how to have a backup system from solar. One of the problems with solar is it only generates during the day, right, when the sun is shining. Uh, well, <laughs> they are including uh, storage now in their large-scale installations. So their uh, renewable por portfolio, I think they're going to be at 50% by 2030. So again, it's the, we can't really blame, the, at least not all of the utilities. Some of the utilities are really trying to get up to speed and um, you know we really support that effort because I don't think uh, we can go 100% with residential. We're going to need all kinds of renewable energy too. Uh, get off fossil fuels as quickly as possible. This article I wrote a, uh, a couple of years ago, I've updated it a few times. This is the probably one of the most popular articles we've ever written. Uh, even and na even now, it just blows everything out of the water in terms of how many people uh, find this article, read this article. And if you think about it, it makes total sense. The the sort of the the holy grail, the the pinnacle of the solutions right now is using the sun to cool us, right? That's that's what people want to know. Is this possible? Can I run, uh, you know, now that we have things like heat pumps, can I run those using solar panels? Because that also makes solar panels far more interesting and valuable, right? Because if you can apply them directly to your cooling system, uh, it, it's a great uh, solution on many levels. So this is the Panasonic Solar, one of their new storage products called the Evervolt. 
And see, these batteries are getting sort of smarter and um, more streamlined in a way. Uh, this one allows you to custom size the battery. And these are sort of residential size, although I think they make uh, commercial as well. But residential size batteries that go from 11 kilowatt hours to 17 point or 11.4 to 17.1 kilowatt hours. So you can decide, you know, what load do you use? Um, and you'll notice under operating modes, they don't, it doesn't say run your whole house. Like that's not the top line, right? So what 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 Panasonic Solar has done, and I think really wisely, is they've shifted towards let's get people safety systems first. Let's get them into solar with a backup that can run everything essential in the house. So before I, I want to touch on that a little bit more, but let me just look at these um, mini split systems. So this is a 17 sear, 24,000 BTU heat pump, and could you run this with a solar array? I actually went back to Panasonic Solar to make sure they checked my math on this. So with a, so that's a 2800 watt mini split with the compressor. Um, my contact at Panasonic Solar, Mukesh Sethi, uh, who, who's very informed on, you know, the different ways to use uh, battery backups and says, said that with an Evervolt, with a 9.6 kilowatt hour version of the Evervolt, you could run this particular mini split for about four hours continuously. That's assuming it had a full charge. Okay, so think about that for a minute. You're in a power outage, it's a heat wave, right? Um, you, are you going to run that? It, it kind of depends on your house, right? How inefficient, how badly insulated in your house. In a well-insulated house, that might get you through the whole evening. Right, and you're also, of course, uh, you're gonna you're gonna turn up your cooling. You're not gonna run it at 68 degrees. You're gonna run it at basically a little bit th that that point when it becomes uncomfortable, which is probably like 78 degrees. So yeah, it, it, you'll want a fan on you when you're sleeping, maybe a, a like a low wattage fan. But you could get through the night, right? Now, if you wanted to have an even more efficient version of this, it would run even longer on solar. You can raise the sear or the efficiency level of the unit. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going to back to that for a second. So you could have a 21.5 sear, uh, which would only require uh, 1,690 watts. Of course, it's going to have a smaller um, cooling output. Now you're thinking, okay, that's great for cooling, but what about heating, right? Can you heat a house? One of the big things like that wouldn't, we didn't need cooling when the Texas freeze here, right? Yes, you can heat with a mini split. Again, you want gonna want a high sear. Now, if you look at heating power input down on my list there, uh, it takes, uh, what, 400, basically about 400 more watts to use it for heating than it does for cooling. So it's gonna drain the batteries a little faster, but again, it is capable of cooling, I mean, I'm sorry, of heating in a crisis situation. Now, you know, batteries are not really designed for these heavy loads, long-term loads, but if that's what they're needed for, we really wanna know what the capacities are. And, and, and the reality is that they can, you know, provide some important life safety systems. Um, you could also isolate a small room. You could go to a high, this is a 22 seer Mitsubishi unit. Um, this operates on 1,020 watts. It only produces 11,000 BTUs of heating, but if you had a, maybe a mechanical room or uh, you just isolated a small part of the house, you could keep it warm for you know significantly, I, I'd say somewhere around, I'm guessing seven, eight hours uh, using that same Evervolt setup. Now this Mitsubishi, one of the things they've really worked on is making their heat pumps compatible at both high and low temperatures, meaning when I say compatible, I mean they still perform, they don't drop off a cliff of performance. So this thing can go down to minus 13 uh, Fahrenheit up to 115 degrees and still operate with some degree of efficiency. That is key uh, to the, using these in emergency scenario. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the Ford F-150 electric pickup truck that's coming out. I know around the office, we have all drooled over them. And uh, and if you haven't watched the ad, it is, uh, if you're, whether or not you like pickup trucks, I recommend it. Uh, but the cool thing about this truck, they say it's going to be able to act as a home generator 
if your power goes out. So what you're going to want to do is have a charging system in your garage that ties in with your home panel, right? So these are pretty common. They claim this thing could run for three days. Uh, I haven't looked at what the actual stats on it. My guess is if you're running, you know, heating and cooling, it's probably shorter than that, but I, I'd have to look at the uh, stats to see the exact output of it. But definitely uh, vehicles are going to become a major part of backup and solar systems. And also you're gonna wanna think about that in the future is that you're probably gonna have at least a hybrid or maybe a full electric vehicle. You're gonna want a little larger solar array. You're gonna want a, an, a, the ability to divert solar charging to that vehicle. Uh, and the vehicle gives you some peace of mind because it, again, it's gonna act as a part of your house, an emergency backup system. All right, I'm gonna switch over to just to wildfires a little bit. Um, you know, the wildfires are part of this heat equation. What do we do? Um, you know, people have built all over the, especially the West and even the Northwest now is, is seeing, you know, bad wildfires. What's the solution, especially if you've already got a place built? And so I'm not gonna get too much into, you know, with the stuff that you can find on FEMA, um, uh, which is basically wildfire zones. I'm just gonna touch on that. But one of the things you wanna think about right away is what's combustible on your house, right? Have you got non-combustible roofing, uh, metal roofing, that sort of thing, and non-combustible su surfaces on the building. Uh, I'm gonna talk about active suppression a little bit. Does it work? Do you wanna try to put some kind of sprinkler system around your house? So what's the effect? Of this? And then ember refusal, I'm gonna get into a, a little bit, which is keeping the embers from getting into your attic or inside your house. So if you haven't seen this before, the way that uh, you know most firefighters and, and you know FEMA and that sort of thing talk about fire now is that you create zones around your house. So they're what they call defensible zones. And you basically, so that you make it so there's nothing to burn when the fire starts rolling in. So this is just the basic stuff. And if you haven't done this, then basically everything else I'm gonna show you is not going to be as effective and may simply not save you. So you just, you basically have no choice. You have to create a defensible zone around your home. Uh, let's look at siding, for example. This chart, if you look over on the left, this, these are how long it took siding to ignite. This was from a master's thesis where they tested a bunch of different sidings. So, uh, the one that lit the fastest was cedar siding. So cedar siding goes poof. Uh, vinyl siding, not far behind. Uh, vinyl tends to you know, melt a little bit before it inflames. Um, uh, one thing that surprised me a little bit was engineered wood did not have a lot of resistance to fire either. I mean, it's obviously a lot more than vinyl siding. Um, but OSB uh, falls into that category as well. So, so one thing is if you have even a good uh, fire resistant siding like fiber cement board, uh, that some of these materials could ignite underneath the fiber cement board. So that's something to think about is no siding product is gonna protect you entirely. If it gets hot enough, the stuff, any wood product in the wall underneath could still ignite. So don't think just because you've got fiber cement on the side of your building that you're 100% safe in a fire. You still need to do all the stuff. Soffit protection. Now these are, this is one of the places that fires go crazy, right? They, they go in through your soffit. Whenever they do a post-mortem on fires, they always find that, that soffits are a big uh, no-no, but they do make special soffits that have a wire mesh that keep embers out. Again, my recommendation would be to go to an unvented attic. Then you have no soffits, problem solved. Uh, if you must do soffits, so you need to have these fire uh, resistant ones. Here's another thing you can do inside that uh, roof cavity. A lot of um, builders will, will sort of drill a hole through that allows the air to go all the way through this uh, vent area and up to the ridge vent. Um, if you offset those holes, the embers can't fly directly through into your cavities or into your attic. This, I, I always bring this up, like uh, this, this presentation is like 95% different from the last one I did, but this is the one thing I touched on last time, which is gable and vents drive me crazy because they're the worst thing in a fire, right? So think about how a gable and vent that, that works. The, the air in the attic gets heated up and then it's on a thermostat. So this fan kicks on and what it's doing is it's usually blowing air out of the attic through one end of the building, 
pulling air in through the other. And so what you do is you actually pull fire, ashes, embers right into your open attic cavity and um, you invite fire into your home with one of these things. Again, another good reason to go with unvented attic. Now you might be thinking, well, what if I put sprinklers outside the house? Will that help me? The answer is yes, it will. Um, but not if you don't do the, the defensible space. So on this chart where it says no defensible space, you can see um, that some there was still some houses that did not survive. Um, that on the purple area says burned without sprinkler, right? And then uh, in the middle, the little uh, I guess teal covered is burned with sprinkler, right? So it, it did help. The sprinklers helped, um, but not anywhere near as much if you have the defensible space and you combine it with sprinklers. Uh, very few of those houses burnt right in the test uh, so um, I think it, it definitely there's a good argument to be made for external uh, sprinkler systems if they're mo used properly one way you can do this you can tie it in with something like a Rachio uh, smart sprinkler controller um, I haven't looked at all the different interfaces and, and you know apps that work with this but I think it would be fairly easy for example to tie in your smart sprinkler controller with uh, so jump ahead to with something like these demand response sensors. I'm sure there's many companies that make these. This is just one I pulled off of Amazon because I, I knew they were out there. What this does is senses temperature outdoors. So say you have a vacation house or you're away from home a lot and you want something that would actually kick on if it got if a you know if a wildfire started spontaneously. Um, something like this might be what you need. I mean, hopefully you have more warning than that. Um, Here's another question though, how much water do you really need to slow a wildfire? Now wildfires tend to spread in different areas, right? Some of them are in the crown area of the trees, some of them are at mid-level and some of them get into the ground and actually burn under the ground. They, like, they, they get all that organic debris and stuff on fire. So that's what you're really going after with a sprinkler system. So I did some calculations and you can argue with me on these if you think, but I, I sort of use some logic which is, when you're watering a lawn and you want to keep the lawn wet, right? You want to keep like six to eight inches of water wet, which is that zone, that ground zone that fire would really love to get into. Um, the, the math is based on your output of your household, <clears throat> the size of the sprinkler heads, and then the, the amount of watering it takes to get an inch of water into the ground, right? So the, the math is that 20 minutes of watering three times a week adds an inch of water into the ground. Now, I hate to recommend anything that might waste water. So you're thinking, oh, geez, do I have to water this thing all the time? You know, another option is that you, uh, you know, you pay closer attention to when wildfire threatens and you sort of saturate ground, you know, at that time. But I think that's a, it's a riskier proposition because, you know, you don't know how much that water is going to turn into runoff, how much, how long will it take to get into the ground. You could certainly put a moisture sensor in the ground. It's another idea as a smart sensor that would tell you when you had reached saturation point. And I believe Ratio works with some of these, these sensors. Um, and then you could have it automatically shut off as soon as it hits a certain like 18% saturation or whatever is required, uh, shut the system off. Okay, now I didn't want to touch on mulch because I, I actually didn't know this until I started researching it. Mulch apparently is a great fire spreader. So one of the things like the, the, the fire safety organizations suggest, first of all, if you look at what they suggest avoiding, shredded rubber, pine needle, shredded cedar bark, those apparently are the most flammable. Uh, you want to avoid those types. Um, their recommendation is do not go more than uh, one or two inches thick of mulch. If you go six inches thick with mulch, it's going to be really hard to get that saturated enough. And more than that, mulch can actually um, uh, combust in high heat because you know you're getting that uh, that that reaction of the hot of the compressed mulch. So if you look at this house picture, I put this in here because one of the recommendations is if you do have mulch anywhere near a house, you need to have a break of rock near the house. Now, I, my recommendation would not be to put it that close. I'd say I, I'd keep it five or six feet out instead of two feet. I think that their rule of thumb was, you know, 18 inches, 24 inches. That's sort of uh, pushing it, uh, especially in a high intensity wildfire. I think it's always better to go with a safer rather than just the expedient. 
Um, and finally on wildfire, I mean, people are looking at different ways to make houses fireproof. I think this is like a little bit, you know, too little, too late is to prevent wildfire with sort of mud bricks and mud walls. Sure, if you're building new and you want to look at these systems, I, I think you could also look at things like, um, you know, cultured stone veneers or, you know, uh, what do you call it, stucco and uh, concrete block systems. There's many different, you know, options if you're really trying to keep uh, wildfire risk down. But again, the common sense stuff and the the known stuff about creating defensible spaces is, is probably your first line of defense. Now, once you get into fires, of course, this is another issue that's been, um, along with the pandemic, which of course really got things rolling on indoor air quality about people caring about indoor air quality. Uh, wildfires are the second one and wildfire smoke is basically especially you know anywhere sort of west of about uh, you know Arkansas you are experiencing uh, some level of wildfire smoke our, our company owners who live in uh, Colorado you know they're in a pristine mountain uh, sort of area are getting wildfire smoke you know six hours from Denver so you, you almost can't escape wildfire smoke and wildfire smoke is extremely toxic that's a lot one thing people don't know is wood burning creates incredibly toxic smoke so I just wanted to mention this because I think people don't understand um, filters and filter efficiency not every filter is good enough to filter out things like uh, wood fire or wildfire smoke you really want a MERV 13 or higher filter to catch that stuff now and you get into pandemic you know virus filtration you're talking like MERV 16. so one of the problems with these is that in a lot of furnace systems if you just throw a MERV 13 filter in there and the system is not designed for it you can actually do damage to a forced air system whether it's cooling or heating <clears throat> so you need to make sure that the system is compatible with this higher level of filtration that you're trying to you're trying to get this gunk out of your air because you can't escape it, right? You live in an area where there's a yellow haze floating out your window. So uh, make sure that you're using a the proper medium. And one way you can tell is how thick or how, I guess, how wide the medium is. If, if it's a one inch filter and it tells you it's MERV 13, I'd be skeptical about that because that means there's not much surface space to catch particles and not much surface space through which the air can flow. So uh, again, you need to use a larger medium um, MERV filter. This, okay, th this one's actually is not a huge medium. It's a small version. It, it does have quite a lot of space because it's pleated all the way down. And the reason I put this in is because a lot of people have energy recovery ventilators. And the problem that we're having, and I, I have one too, and I love it, and it's great for, for example, when it's 90 degrees outside and you don't want to lose all your air conditioning, you bring in fresh air with one of these uh, like Panasonic, uh, you know, ERVs. Problem is that if it's smoky outside, right, you don't want to bring the smoke in too. So you really have to have a MERV 13 or higher filter built into your ERV or else you find yourself in a position where you don't want to use your ERV because the outdoor air quality is so bad. So I just bring that up because when you're looking at ERVs, you want to look for one that has is compatible with higher level MERV filters. Now, as if this all wasn't bad enough, then we got to worry about flooding, right? We've got droughts and flooding and heat and it just sounds like doom and gloom. Well, I hate to say it, but this is coming down the pike too. Um, so this is interesting. A couple of years ago, um, a study of how flood threats are changing. Now, what this study um, didn't include is sea level change, right? And the effects of sea level change. So these are just areas uh, that, you know, it says trends in liquid water. So look at sort of where the, the red areas are. Um, that's, you know, that these are areas that saying you're going to see more flooding more, more flood frequency now now but now look at this next chart this is from the hill uh the blue areas are areas that you know given an existential uh, you know sea level rise are going to see massive impacts from migration which basically means everybody's going to flee right so in these areas whether or not they all get out of there whether or not they're all underwater it's going to be disrupted like nobody's ever seen before but that's part of the story, right? But the areas that are in dark purple are also going to be massively disrupted. So if you if you look at this map and you look at this map, 
there's nowhere safe except, I don't know, let's see, maybe out west, maybe that little white area. Uh, was it New Mexico, uh, Arizona, you know, maybe some of that area. That's the only place that's not going to be slammed uh, by some of these these water related climate change impacts. So I just, you know, anybody who thinks, well, we'll be fine here. And, I, you know, we always thought that in Maine, too. And then it was 100 degrees for two weeks in a row. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's called hubris. And I've, I've been guilty of it, too. But uh, I'm, my eyes are are open now. <laughs> uh, Miami Beach flooding, this is a little bit older, but you know, the, this trend you're seeing. So, you know, one of the things that I call it the slow boiling frog thing that's happening with sea level rise, it's right now it's, it's happening very slowly, but what happens is when you have a storm, the water stays a little longer, the tide, you know, comes a little higher, the, it's, it's in small increments, at least for now, doesn't mean that it won't shift into something much worse. But the reason that you haven't seen a panic is because it's been coming at us slowly for years. Um, we'll see what the future holds. Uh, I think one of the things the future holds, whether or not there's a dramatic rise in sea level, which of course scientists aren't aren't really saying that we're going to have you know you know yards or more of sea level rise till like 2050. But they've been wrong on almost everything else, so I'm I'm not real confident that those estimates are accurate. They they seem to the headline that if you're like me, you read every day is scientists surprised by is the is the beginning of it. Scientists surprised by Arctic melting. Scientists surprised by movement of glaciers. Um, so one thing that I would say is going to happen in fairly short order is you're going to see people raising their house. One of the ways that there's you know um, hundreds of thousands of, uh, if not more than a million houses around the southeast that are these concrete block houses. Uh, these are actually, I think you're going to see a whole sort of industry spring up of elevating these because it's it's again it's not necessarily a super expensive or doesn't have to be a, a an unaffordable project where essentially you convert your lower story into you know a car parking area a foundation system it requires some re-engineering and some reinforcement but then you build on top of it either with you know a sip panels i uh, or or um, two by six framing, there's many different ways you can build the top level and elevate the house and you can gain, you know, eight, nine feet and put yourself in the new building code and maybe make the house survivable for another, you know, 20, 30, who knows how long, depending on what happens. So anyway, just throw that out there because if you're a builder, maybe you're looking for a niche. I think this is a, is a coming niche. I don't think it's hit quite yet because I don't think people have had the existential aha yet that they need to do something. But when it does, it, you might wanna be ahead of the curve. Uh, I'm gonna wrap it there. I think I've, I've done a lot of talking, put a lot of ideas out there and um, I'll, I'll take a few questions if anybody's uh, got any thoughts or questions, maybe Mike could field those for me. Thank you. All right, thanks Matt. And yes, uh, we do have time for a few questions. We've got a few that have already come in, Matt. So we'll go ahead okay. and start with those. Um, so Doug had a question, um, well, actually more of a comment, uh, when you were talking about Steve Easley's house and his situation with the transformer, um, yep. his comment was we shouldn't have 400 amp service panels on our houses. Can you talk a little bit more about um, you know, what houses typically have and why would he have such a, a large service panel? Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I, I tend to agree, um, it's a, what he did is he bought a large house that was, I don't know what the exact square footage of it. And, you know, he uh, is using it as a demonstration project. It's one of our, what's called our revision house project. But I agree, most houses, there's no reason you would have a 400 amp service. I mean, ideally what you're doing, you should be doing is trying to reduce your load. I think what he said is because the, because of the square footage of the house that they, uh, and the, so they were trying to convert it. It was very inefficient prior to the renovation. Um, I think they were sort of stuck with the bones of it. That's one of the challenges, and it's true up north too, is we have a lot of these old big houses. So this was an older big house, and you're kind of faced with what do you do with that footprint? Do you you know, close off part of the house and try to live in half of it? I mean, I think ultimately what will happen with some of these large houses, they'll be converted into multiple dwellings, and then maybe the four, I guess that would be my rationalization is the 400 amp service that's required right now for one family 
will eventually be, you know, for, and maybe in 20, 30 years, there'll be a 400 amp service for four families that are using this space. So I, I actually agree with Doug. There's no reason that you should have to, um, to ramp up your electric in a normal situation that much. Um, you know, especially, you know, give, give what we really want to do is try to crunch down that number as much as possible and, you know, reduce our electrical needs by, you know, by being net zero, essentially. We had a question come in from uh, Mary Jo. Uh, she wanted to know if anyone in the U.S. has considered a study on how the reflective heat from a, uh, a massive array of solar panels uh, affects the atmosphere. Um, and she, she says that uh, there was a plan that she had heard of to install a massive array, solar array, in the Sahara. And that could help support the European grid, but they discovered it would actually throw back more heat and change European weather patterns. Uh, I'd have to see, I mean, that sounds a little bit, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it sounds a little bit conspiracy theory-ish to me. Um, I would say that, you know, my guess would be that you'd really have to look at the reflective aspects of panels, the power generation, and the, you know, b before you just go after the fact that these panels are, you know, getting hot and re-emitting heat. I, again, I, I can't really comment on it. I don't have the data in front of me, but I would not jump to any conclusions about that without seeing an actual, uh, some actual research on it. Uh, it's too easy to jump to conclusions. I mean, you've seen this stuff about, you know, which is sort of a, another, I consider it sort of a conspiracy theory thing about, you know, wind turbines being dangerous because they blow up. I haven't seen any evidence that supports that. Um, so again, I think more study, anytime you come up with these theories or you hear about these theories, I'd make sure that they are fully supported by by some real data. Uh, I have a question for you, Matt. Um, you mentioned the Ford Lightning and mm -hmm. its power generation ability. Um, have you seen any similar claims being made by Tesla about their vehicles? Uh, no, I, I haven't. Although I don't see why uh, there would they they would not. I mean, I think any vehicle that has a significant uh, you know large battery with significant number of kilowatt hours, they basically could could be used the same way unless there's some um, you know technological hurdle that Tesla has built in with, to its vehicles but as far as I know any electric vehicle could essentially do the same thing it's just a question of you know how much how large are the batteries how long will they last? I mean one thing to think about is they're all batteries are not created equal and you really want a deep it has to be a special kind of deep cycle battery if you use a standard you know auto battery and use it for a solar system and you drain it you you basically damage the battery you need something that's designed to be drained beyond 50 percent and and back and i'm sure that tesla is i'm sure the same way that uh, panasonic solar you know evervolt batteries are designed with that in mind okay uh you know while we're talking about solar and uh batteries um had a question come in from marion now what do you need to use your electric vehicle's power for the house in an emergency is there some special kind of wiring panel yeah or I, I think all about? i think i think all you would need i mean honestly i don't think it would be that that complicated i think you'd need an inverter system um, you know, that basically converts that essentially DC power to AC power. And I think, you know, any qualified electrician could do that for you. So it'd be a, essentially a reverse feed. And typically when you, like when you, you're using it in the place of a generator. So you need to make sure that basically there's a kill switch on the house. So you can't accidentally uh, feed what the, the big safety issue is feeding electricity back into the lines while workers are working on them. So an electrician will come and he'll put a switch on that only allows you the electricity to sort of go one way from the vehicle um, and, and maybe from the solar panels at the same time. But you need a, an electrician to set that up for you. You don't want to sort of um, set, try to create sort of a patch together system on your own because you could be liable if you you know accidentally electrocute someone when the power comes back on suddenly uh we got a question or uh, sorry a comment in from doug when you were talking about the mini splits and uh his comment was that you know if we build right the mini splits should work fine and for much longer than four hours do you do you concur with that 
Yeah, I think he's right. You know, and if you think of like the one I the example of the 22 sear unit that I gave, which is, you know, it's only a thousand watts, right? So it's 11, it's 11,000 BTU output. I think you could, uh, you know, you could put, right, if you build right, so the house is real tight, uh, the air is managed uh, carefully, uh, you could with, you know, two or three of those, you could probably heat and cool the whole building with with solar. And I think if you look at modern, well-built off-grid houses, I think some of them are already using um, mini splits exclusively for heating and cooling. Part of the problem we're up against, of course, is that, you know, most of the houses in the country are not net zero or even close to it. So, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to also sort of uh, help people who are not in that position to to bring their house to net zero, or you know, they don't have the funds, or they're or they're just trying to essentially figure out a way to use some of these renewable resources to to help meet this this existential threat. Right. Uh, a couple more questions for you, Matt. Uh, one from William, yep. and uh, you may have to jump back to a certain slide. I'm not sure, but he uh, he said that you mentioned five considerations for resilient house design. Uh, mm -hmm. He was wondering if you could go back over item number three. He, he missed that one. Let's see if I can get back there. Sorry, guys. Yeah, that's way back. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Does he, or if you can just remember, does he remember which one it was or? I think that, uh, that was, not, that, that wasn't it. Was, that was, no, that, that wasn't this section. It was just, yeah, well, these were just some of the things, flyer, flood, drought. And then I said, uh, you know, life support systems. I think that maybe that's a slide he misses. Uh, or he was uh, talking about air filtration. One thing I didn't ta touch on much was fresh water conservation. Um, you know, I touched on it incidentally, I guess, with with lawns and that sort of thing. You know, how much water, because half of our water use, especially out west, is from irrigation. Um, and, you know, having smart irrigation systems is a big deal. And, you know, of course, how you landscape, that sort of thing. Well, one thing I would mention, uh, which I didn't mention in in this, is that there are... Uh, leak detection products, if you're not familiar with them, there's a couple different brands that have algorithms that will tell you if there's a leak anywhere. You put them on right at where the water comes into your house. Uh, two different brands, there's Finn by Upinor, PHYN, and there's Flow by Moen that I know of. Um, the, and there's a lot of other brands, I think, sort of coming along. Um, what this does, it detects anytime there's, an, uh, there's a weird water usage in the house and it shuts down the whole house water system and this is big not only for conserving water but for not letting your house get destroyed by a water leak um, so it, it's a I, I think it's a good investment to uh and, and a way also you know I've, I've heard many horror stories about irrigation systems that spring a leak underwater and you know hundreds of thousands of gallons are are wasted before the leak is discovered you basically you get a water bill for 600 bucks then when normally it's a hundred and you have no idea why, well, one of these systems could prevent that. Yeah, there's uh, there's Finn and Flow and Flume, and it starts to sound like yeah. a Dr. Seuss book after a while. But uh, yeah. um, wanted to let you know, Matt, that William said thank you, that that was exactly what he was looking for, which you got up on the screen. So good job there, Matt. Okay. Um, we're gonna take a final question here from Nancy. Sure. Um, she says, uh, you know, lightweight concrete or pumice crete is considered to be fireproof, but do you see that product being used more widely to build more homes? Um, not perceptibly yet, but I will say that, you know, one of the challenges, for example, I remodeled a place recently and tried to make it flood proof. And there's a stuff called, uh, it's called MGO, it's magnesium oxide panels. And I had written about them, I had read about them, but apparently they're very hard to get in the US. So what, what they are is uh, essentially an inert material. And it sounds to me like what you're talking about are some more inert materials, which honestly, I think we should be building with those more. Um, we should be building with, now, now part of the trick is concrete, concrete or cement has a very high embodied energy, meaning it creates a lot of pollution. So what we want is products like that that are made without traditional uh, Portland cement processes. So you got to be a little bit careful. You might 
be, um, you know, doing the right thing in terms of fire, but at the same time, you might be creating a lot more CO2. So I'd say look at the product, find out what its sort of green uh, cred credentials are, and you can probably find, uh, you know, s sort of cementitious products that are that are essentially inert or minerals mineral based, like. Um, you know, certain insulations like rock wool and stuff that are mineral based. Uh, and and you could definitely, I'd like to see more use of that, especially in wildfire areas, especially in new construction. But I haven't seen it yet, no. Um, one one last question, if we can sneak it in um, sure. uh, from Marion. What, what about hempcrete? Is, is that something that is fireproof? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I haven't actually looked. I think I'll look into that. I I, I think if it is, that's a great uh, that's a great alternative. I, I'm aware of hempcrete, not have never really looked into its fire um, characteristics, but now I will. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion. I wish I wish I could answer you now, but I'll, you know what? Maybe I'll write a little article about it once I find out whether that's a good uh, that might be a good option, especially as a green, you know, um, Fire resistant product. Great, and thank you for uh, for asking that. Um, yeah. All right, well, that's all I see right now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it off there. But uh, Matt, always thank you for uh, for joining us and for sharing your knowledge and taking the questions. We really do appreciate it. Um, and uh, we want to certainly thank our sponsors. Uh, that's Panasonic Solar, the Metal Roofing Alliance, and Power Shift by NV Energy for their generous sponsorships. And thank you to our audience as well. Um, you know, we don't, we, we wouldn't do this without you. And uh, we certainly appreciate the questions and your attendance. And if you caught, have missed any part of this, this is going to get posted on Green Builder Media's YouTube channel. So you can always check it out there. <clears throat> now, join us next week as we'll be joined by Gary Klein, hot water expert and all around good guy. Uh, he's gonna be talking about how to improve hot water systems in both single family and multifamily buildings. And we're gonna start that webinar Wednesday, July 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So until next week, stay safe out there and take care everyone.